So I'd like to get started. Welcome back. Uh, before I introduce today's lecture, let me say I posted some more information on the web page, which is a pointer to uh, all the software and online tutorials for the frameworks that were discussed last time, if you want more information about them. So today's speaker is Professor Catherine Yellick, who's the Associate Lab Director of Computing Sciences at LBL and the Director of NERSC. So if you have any complaints about Franklin, she's the one to ask about. <laughs> No, no complaints about Franklin. We closed the uh, complaint line on that because it's, uh, it's being shipped away on April 30th. So actually, not, uh, May 1st, but you know. Um, so yeah, how, how, how are things going at NERSC? Is it, you've been using Hopper, right, for some of the assignments? Only Franklin? Oh, guys need to switch to Hopper. <laughs> the, the TAs need to. Okay, all right, all right. Well, yeah, it's all about the market economics of the supercomputers. It has nothing to do with what the technology is. So um, I'm going to talk about exascale computing, and um, I'll, talk, I'll talk a little bit about um, science, so why scientists should care about exascale, and then I'll talk um, about uh, why computer scientists and mathematicians should care. And, and some of this you've heard in various other lectures during the semester, so I'll skip over some of the parts that, um, but just kind of remind you of how they fit into exascale. So um, when I think about what kind of computing happens at NERSC, I like to divide it into three categories. Um, science that happens at scale, so these are running the biggest problems on the biggest machines. Science that happens through volume of computing, um, so running massive numbers of jobs, and certainly many people at NERSC do that, and we've been, we're, we're working on projects to try to make that easier. And then science that comes up from, the, um, from exploring the data. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about um, some examples and how these are scaling to exascale. So um, uh, Brian will re recognize our burning uh, flame. So this is a, uh, and others, I guess, from the, from the lab. So this is a, a project that uh, John Bell, who's an applied mathematician, has worked on with, um, with um, Cheng, who is in the uh, energy efficiency division at the lab, and is looking at designing, um, understanding the process of combustion so that you can design more energy efficient devices. So Robert Cheng, who's the, the scientist there who's got his hands on that burner, it's called a low swirl burner, which is something that he designed a number of years ago. Actually, it's been licensed in various designs to industry. Um, but he, uh, uh, and the idea of this is that it's, a, it's kind of redesigned the way the combustion, uh, the combustion burner works so that it's very energy efficient. And you can tell partly that none of the heat is leaking out of the sides because he's got the hands on, around the burner, right? That's just pointing out how cool the actual burner device itself is. So don't, don't try this at home. Um, so uh, what, and what, what, what do they want to do? They want to allow more flexible fuels in it. So look at hydrogen-rich fuels, so things like biofuels or other kinds of um, fuels to be used in these burners. And in order to do that, you have to understand the details of the combustion process. And so John Bell's group, who works on combustion simulation, um, and it works on adaptive mesh refinement algorithms and things that you've uh, heard about. You heard about cactus last time, I think, in, or last week and a couple of weeks ago in Chombo. Um, so those are um, some of the kinds of things. This is actually built on top of a uh, box lab. Um, library, and this is a simulation. And so they're, they're trying to put more details into it. So um, there's actually a project, an exascale project um, on co-design, which I'll talk about later, um, to look at how these kinds of applications will run on exascale computers. And um, you need that, you need an exascale computer in order to do things like design um, the, understand all of the, the details of the chemistry um, in order to design these, these kind of devices for alternative fuels. Um, second example, this is kind of the canonical high-performance computing problem. You've heard about it um, before, and this one also uses adaptive mesh refinement. You see a little simulation up there. This is looking at climate change, and this is a particular part of a climate change problem, which is looking at sea ice. So one of the problems is that in understanding the, the impacts of how the climate is changing, you need to understand how warming the ocean melts the ice and then causes the sea level to rise. So there's this, um, there's this complicated feedback loop, and so this is looking particularly at Antarctica. Um, at the ice sheet, and, um, and the sea level rise is caused by the melting of the Antarctic ice sheet. And um, there weren't the, all of these features were not in the previous climate models. This code was actually built, um, I believe, from scratch on top of Chombo um, with, in collaboration with um, other labs and people at Lawrence Berkeley Lab, including Brian's group, Phil Colella's group, um, has been, have worked on the math and some of the, the um, software side of things, and um, there's other people from the climate community um, that are involved as well. And... This is uh, uh, because you need to understand very fine resolution. The details of what's happening as the ice um, interacts with the water um, is important to understanding how quickly things will melt and, and the um, dynamics of the, the flow. So this is showing different resolutions of how the, um, the, the uh, 
water flows into these, these pockets in the ice, and you can see that um, on the right-hand side you have a much more detailed uh, but adaptive mesh where you've got very fine cells at some places, and you, you see a different physical behavior than you see on the left-hand side. This has used a lot of hours already. There's a, a collaboration with a bunch of other projects that I'm kind of um, mushing them all together here. Um, so there's work that's going on in the um, energy uh, uh, the um, Earth Systems Division, also at the lab, Bill Collins Group, um, and they're going to look at putting these models back into the full-scale climate model that has all the other dynamics and so into this in the system. So you need an exascale computer to try to combine all of these different features into these global-scale climate models. Um, one that I uh, that I haven't expanded on here, but is kind of one of the driving applications is resolving clouds. So climate models today don't really have a, a detailed model of what a cloud looks like. In order to get that, you would need uh, a system that's about a thousand times faster than the petascale system like HOP that we have at, um, at NERSC. Let me just add, we will have a lecture on climate modeling by Michael Weiner of NERSC in a, but before the end of the That's semester. That's right. So, yeah. And I, so I, there, are, there are a few other forward pointers I'm going to have to the, the uh, remaining lectures here. So thanks for reminding me of that one. Um, so the last area where you need really big computing devices is in data. And this is one which um, I think there are a lot of people going around saying data, data, data is really important. We don't care about these big computers. We only care about data. Uh, unfortunately, if you've got a lot of data, you need a lot of computing in order to actually understand something about the data. Um, this is just looking at that. This is a cover from um, Science Magazine. It was an article or uh, actually an, an issue of Science Magazine looking at the top 10 breakthroughs in, in Science Magazine's opinion of the last decade. Um, and so, and, and it turns out that four of them were actually from the lab. Um, they all involved computing on large data sets. So three of them were genomics problems um, and uh, understanding, uh, you know, the, this kind of stuff called junk DNA was one of them, understanding some of the uh, um, microorganisms and understanding their, their behavior. And then uh, one, another one was on cosmic microwave background. And I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. So one in physics. And the um, data rates, so there's, a, you know, everybody talks about the data tsunami that's coming. Um, this little graph down here is a really rough approximation of how things are growing. So the um, sequencers, so all the genomics problems are kind of along that blue line. That's actually a cost line. So you may have seen the cost of sequencing. You act, there's actually now a kind of a prototype device out that, that is about the size of a thumb drive that you you can plug into your uh, laptop and then get it, you know, it's about this big and you can put a material in it and it gets a little tiny um, strand of uh, a biological material and you can, you can sequence it. So sequencers used to be these huge um, things and now they're really tiny and, um, and very inexpensive. That's been driven down by the market because of the interest in the human genome, but there are a lot of problems that, for example, the people at the lab are interested in genomics that have to do with biofuels and, and um, the environmental impact um, and things like that that involve biology and therefore genomics. Um, detectors is another big area at the lab. If you look up the hill, there's the advanced light source, which is that domed building. Um, and it is, you know, for taking, just very roughly taking pictures of little tiny things that move really fast. Um, there's a plan to, to build an, a next generation light source in the next 10 years, um, and that'll have uh, a uh, data rate that is much higher than today, um, and so it, it kind of follows that, that line. So CCDs, which are the detector device inside of those light sources, um, are getting more dense, faster than Moore's Law, and, ha and having a higher rep rate. So these things are faster than Moore's Law, um, which is this kind of measly looking green curve down here. That's processor performance. And uh, um, even worse than that, of course, is the memory gap. So the last line on that is the um, increase in memory performance. And so you can see that there's a big problem. If you have a data intensive problem, you're going to have a problem with computing as well as the memory access. Um, keep in mind that when you, when you compute on the data, it's not just that it's, a lot of the algorithms are not linear in the size of the data that are coming out. So some like, something like genomics problems, if you're running BLAST algorithms, you're often um, comparing doing something like an order n squared algorithm or an n times m algorithm where you have a database and you're matching everything against that. Um, so these things scale super linearly. Um, so that's, uh, that's even worse and that, than the, um, the uh, scaling of Moore's law. And then the, uh, and of course, computing performance itself is not keeping up with Moore's law. It's putting more transistors on the chip but not necessarily making the processors faster. And you've heard a lot about that. So um, a little bit more about science through volume. I think I've it's kind of mixed up these slides. Let me do the last data one first, and, uh, um, and then I'll go back and do the volume one. So in the, um, if you look at the last couple of uh, physics Nobel Prizes from Berkeley, one of them is actually based on modeling and simulation. Um, that was um, the la last year's Saul Perlmutter's prize. Um, it's using supernovae as a standard candle trying to un and understanding the expansion of the universe and in particular the acceleration of the expansion of the universe. That was based on some simulations done in the 90s by um, Peter Nugent, who's still um, a researcher at Berkeley Lab. 
um, and uh, to try to understand what supernova look like from the Earth so you can figure out well, if you're going to use these things as markers in the sky to try to figure out the expansion, you need to understand what they're supposed to look like from uh, that distance. Um, but in terms of large data analysis, um, the, the 2006 Nobel Prize, which was George Smoots, was um, looking at cosmic microwave background. And I won't say a lot more about that because Julian Burrell, I think, is going to be coming um, and to talk a little, uh, in a lot more detail about really, really amazing things that you can understand about the Big Bang um, by looking at uh, these kind of images, uh, the, uh, the, the temperature map, if you will, of the sky, which is the cosmic microwave background. Um, and, but just to give you something that's a more recent result, since Peter is not going to be coming to talk, um, this is not really related to the cosmic microwave background, but he's also looking at these supernovae still today. Um, and there's a, a project that runs called the Polymer Transient Factor Factory, um, which is looking at all these images coming in from telescopes. And there's about 300 gigabytes of data per night that's delivered through the, night, the science network called ESNet into NERSC and is automatically filtered through using these pr fairly simple uh, machine learning algorithms, and they, they automatically detect something that looks sort of like a, a transient, that is something that looks different, that has changed in the sky. And then um, scientists around the world look at the results of those data to look for things like supernovae, which are exploding. And this, using this system, he was able to see um, a supernova that was probably the, one of the youngest supernova ever. I think it was the youngest and um, also very nearby supernova. And they were able to redirect telescopes and get these images of um, what happened. I know it's, it's a little hard to see. It's that little tiny dot there right next to the, the uh, green arrow. But anyway, it uh, allows them to see uh, uh, you know, these, uh, these very young supernovae. So, you know, we, we've had a lot of growth in computing performance. You've seen numbers on the top 500 list. This is actually a set of numbers I put through, uh, put together from, from the uh, Gordon Bell Prize um, awards, which are handed out at supercomputing, the supercomputing conference every November. Um, and these are application results. So these are applications running on some of the largest machines. Um, and uh, you can see that this exponential growth path that we've seen from the top 500 also exists for these very large-scale applications. Now, these are admittedly somebody taking a large application and then scaling it up to run on the biggest problem. Jim knows a lot about it because he's been on the committee. Go ahead, Jim. I just said the vertical axis is? <laughs> oh, uh, is flops. Sorry. Yes, yeah, flops. So um, there's a, there's, there's, here's the petaflop results over here on Jaguar and on the, uh, the K machine, the Japanese K machine. And... Uh, was the one underneath that. Uh, I think that was, um, I don't remember, I think that's one of the craze. But, um, so yeah, those are the, some of the biggest application results. Now, what happened in, in here, um, and it's important to sort of understand how hard it was to make this kind of scaling results, these scaling results happen. In the early 90s, if you ask somebody what a supercomputer was, it was a big, fat vector machine, probably built by Cray if you're in the United States, maybe built by NEC if you're in Japan. Um, and uh, these were you know, they, they had started making, putting multiple processors in them, but there were small numbers of processors, and the processors were very fast and very wide vector units. And um, there was this, this uh, paper written or talk given called Attack of the Killer Micros, um, which sort of characterized what happened then, which is all of the, the um, it was so much cheaper to build a supercomputer by tying together a bunch of standard microprocessors that that's the way people started doing it. So this graph, and this is from the top 500 list, looks at the history of the architectures, and you've probably seen a variation of this before, but just to kind of highlight here, you know, these are the, the these SMPs and single processor machines over here on the left. Um, those were pretty easy to program. They were, um, you, you would program those by annotating your, your Fortran code, for example, your Fortran loops, um, and that's the way the, the supercomputers looked back here in 1993, at least a lot of them. And these massively parallel machines, and then also clusters, constellations, I'm never quite sure of the definition, but it's kind of like groups of these um, clusters. If you kind of look at all the blue and green things together, they're, they're roughly speaking the same kinds of message passing based uh, machines in terms of how you program them, typically. Um, and those became very popular and have basically taken over the HPC um, market entirely. Now, just as an aside, um, industrial use, uh, in, just as measured by the machines in the top 500 list, which isn't a very good indication, but the number of machines in the top 500 list that are in industry as opposed to in academia or in government labs went from about 25% in that time period to about 50% um, today. So there's a lot more use of um, HPC in, in industry. And um, I was actually at a workshop recently on um, the use of modeling and simulation in industry, and I think the most interesting thing to me was how little the people from industry w wanted to talk about what they did, because it's considered such a competitive advantage that they really don't want their competitors to know how big their clusters are, what kinds of simulations they're running, and what they're doing. So there were representatives there from Dow, from Goodyear, from um, 
uh, Procter and Gamble, um, and uh, and they're actually. I, I should. We should put a link on the page to the uh, Niter D talk. Yeah, Niter. John Shelf told us about diapers last time. Right. Okay. So you've heard about diapers, right? So anyway, um, that, that's a, that's a popular story, and, and toilet paper is another one. So they, you know they make toilet paper at 40 miles an hour, and you got to perforate it just right so that it doesn't fall apart while you're uh, manufacturing it, but but it does fall apart when you want it to. Um, so uh, yeah, these are all all big big problems. But uh, you know, tires, oil and gas, basically all these other uh, chemicals have. There's a lot of modeling and simulation that goes on in industry. So as I said before, these were kind of programmed by annotation. These have been programmed by completely rethinking the algorithms and the software that people had used here um, in order to think about making it parallel, which is all about what you've been learning about in this class. Um, so now what's going to happen? Well, um, well, the first thing that you've also heard about is in about 2004, the rest of the world heard about parallel computing because um, we stopped being able to make processors faster. So everybody else started talking about parallelism, and it became a popular thing as opposed to just a sort of a niche within computer science, and the rest of the everybody else started worrying about it. And so now everything, including your laptop, is uh, a multi-core processor. And um, so if we look at the next uh, you know, exascale application, um, and we try to project out where that's going to be. Um, I think 2020, by the way, is very uh, optimistic. I don't think it'll probably happen then, but if you just kind of plot this out, that's where it looks like it will happen. And what happens in between here is um, what I'm calling, and this is a phrase from John Schalp, um, attack of the killer cell phones. So um, this is because we're going to have to worry about energy. So getting to exascale is all about energy efficiency of the computing system. So I'll say, and I'll say more about these, these cell phones. So, um, what, so in, uh, I was involved in a DARPA study um, a few years ago, actually, looking at exascale and the, the challenges of getting to exascale. Um, most of the people on the committee were hardcore um, hardware people, so we spent most of the meetings talk about, talking about pico, picojoules per bit and picojoules per um, uh, a, a byte moved and uh, or bit transferred, and also picojoules per flop and things like that, so how much energy was involved. And um, the projection that was made from that, that group and, and involved a number of people from industry and well, as well as academia and the labs um, looked at this, um, said, well, okay, we get energy efficiency improvements from, um, from, uh, from Moore's Law because every time you shrink the transistors, the wires get shorter and you can do things with, um, you can do computing with, with less energy. So if you look at the usual um, benefits of Moore's Law and you project out what it would cost to build kind of your biggest HPC system in a number of different time frames, um, so your 200 cabinet system or so is out here at 200 gigawatts, yeah, sorry, 200 megawatts in 2020. So how much is 200 megawatts? Well, the um, Hopper system, the biggest system that we have at, um, actually not physically the biggest, but the, the fastest system that we have at NERSC, which is a petaflop system, it uses about three megawatts, very roughly speaking. Um, a megawatt of power per year costs me as a center director about a, a million dollars, okay? So three million dollars to run the Hopper system. By the way, we like to keep that system busy all the time as a result because if you're powering it, you want to make sure that um, it's being fully utilized. So that means if we were going to build one of these exaflop machines in two megawatts, it would cost $200 million a year just to pay the energy bill. And that's taking into account Moore's Law improvements. So, um, okay, so the goal is to try to see if we can do this in only 20 megawatts because the idea is, well, we could imagine paying $20 million a year in electricity. Our annual budget at NERSC is about $55 million a year, so it's not completely out of the question that in 10 years we could spend that much money. So exascale design is really about energy constrained design. Um, it turns out that a lot of the rest of the computing challenges, whether you're talking about handheld devices or you're talking about cloud computing, are also about energy constrained design. But it certainly is the case in high performance computing. Now as soon as you say energy efficiency, people think that you're talking about how to, um, how to make the data centers energy efficient as possible. And we worry about this a lot at NERSC. Um, the lab has a group, whole, the division, the energy efficiency uh, technology division, EETD, that I mentioned before um, with the low swirl burners also worries about things like the efficiency of data centers. And they did a, a study that's um, highly regarded on, on the um, efficiency of the different data centers. And this metric that is used for measuring data center efficiency is called PUE, um, the Power Utilization Energy Metric. I forget exactly what the acronym stands for. Uh, power Utilization Effectiveness, there it is. Um, and it's, uh, it, it is basically the total amount of facility power divided by the, the amount of power that's going into the um, into the compute systems themselves. So everything you lose from the transfer of the, the energy, the, the power throughout the uh, machine room floor um, through UPS devices, loss in cooling, that is the amount of energy it takes to run the cooling devices, which can be substantial, are all in kind of the above one 
number. And this is where um, the NERSC facility is right here at about 1.3. It's pretty, that's a very well um, optimized data center. These are, by the way, all, in general, pretty optimi well optimized centers. The average is about 1.8. Um, they look at the, uh, across all the different data centers that they studied. Um, we're building a new CRT building. If you come up the hill, you see, you'll see a lot of construction. Um, our target there is 1.1. So, you know, energy efficiency of data centers is a good thing, um, but we're, we're working pretty hard to get that down to, to as close to one as possible. If you're at 10% overhead, there's not a lot more headroom that we're going to have in terms of making it more efficient. So this is not about, um, Exascale is not about making the data centers more efficient, um, it, but it, it's certainly a good thing to do. So how do we really want to measure efficiency? If the name of the game is optimizing for energy, um, well, what would a, um, a second-rate university do? They would look at, uh, they, they say, well, we want to know how much, how much science gets done per joule, so maybe we'll just look, count publications. We'll just say how many publications are done um, per joule. And um, we don't do that at Berkeley, right? We're much more sophisticated about how we measure scientific input. That's why I said second-rate university. But anyway, um, so you can, you can try to do that. And, and in 2010, before we actually installed Hopper, um, we ran at 450 publications per megawatt year. Um, and I believe that that um, corresponds to 70 gigajoules per publication, something like that. Someone else did the, the uh, translation for me, so I hope that's right. But um, and, and unfortunately, though, that number is dropping. The, the number of publications per megawatt year is dropping because um, when we installed Hopper, um, we roughly doubled the amount of energy that the facility uses per year, and we did not double the number of publications because we didn't double the number of scientists. And, and publications tends to be limited by people, um, not by uh, joules. But, um, so then we said, well, okay, what's the most energy efficient s system that we have inside of NERSC, um, and you know, how should we be thinking about this efficiency thing? Well, we looked at an old HPC system. You know what that is. That's Franklin. A new HPC system. That's Hopper. This is a cluster. That's Carver. Um, in the middle there, and, um, and this says that the most energy efficient system per core hour is Hopper. That's kind of a funny metric, um, but it is, but, but because per core hour, that energy efficiency though does improve over time with Moore's Law as you add more cores onto a chip. And so this really isn't very surprising. Um, there's different pieces of it um, looking at the, uh, the personnel involved. So the most expensive machine per core hour in terms of personnel is the cluster. Why is that? Because it's the smallest system. We do not scale the number of system administrators with the number of cores on the system, fortunately. And so, um, you know, we have a couple of system administrators that are the key people on each one of the systems, um, and that kind of is independent of the size. I mean, it's not quite true. If you have got a really small system, you may have one system administrator for multiple systems. But at a certain scale, um, it doesn't matter when you start adding more racks into the system. So the most energy efficient system is the newest system because it's uh, kind of at the furthest out in terms of Moore's Law. It is the, um, it is the uh, um, largest system as well because the, no the number of system administrators per, um, per uh um, per system or per core is, is the lowest. And, um, and then, you know, probably the newest system also has the most energy efficient cooling capabilities in it because people have done innovations there. So, um, so don't think that your small cluster that you're running in your own lab is, the, is really energy efficient because it, it probably is actually very energy inefficient. And if you've looked at this, you actually want to replace machines about every four to five years because um, in about five years, you can replace the system for the delta in the cost of energy of running those Two systems. So we're looking at, as you know, replacing Franklin. That Franklin is a 100 cabinet system. We can probably replace it by about four cabinets today. Now those are bigger cabinets, but still four, from 100 cabinets to four cabinet gives, gives you a sense of how much power we'll save too. So the next best thing um, besides me measuring, because we can't really figure out how to measure science productivity very well, is we can measure application performance. And that's probably the right thing to do. Um, and th but it, even if you look at that, the newest and largest systems are going to be the most energy efficient. Question? Yes. How about Nobel Prizes per Joule? Berkeley yeah, I thought, yeah, there. Nobel Prizes per Joule, I think we're definitely winning. We've got three Nobel Prizes at NERSC, um, the Smoots Nobel Prize, Perlmutter's Nobel Prize, and um, the IPCC, no, IPCC Nobel Prize, which was shared by a number of different data centers, uh, supercomputing centers around the world. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, yes, we, uh, um, I, think, I think three, you know, two point whatever is, is probably the, uh, the largest number of Nobel Prizes per supercomputing center. And there's a... Uh, Another thing to, to kind of look at in here, which is um, that in general, we can, we can talk about downclocking the processors, we can talk about turning things off or turning things down, but really we've put a lot of money into buying the hardware, buying the data center, the cooling infrastructure, and the best thing we can do, certainly from a price performance, is run everything at the maximum output and then just shut it down if we were actually done with all of our science, which of course we never will be. Yes. 
Is blue there the capital cost? Um, oh yeah, sorry. That's the um, that's that's the hardware cost, right? Yeah, sorry. And that that also goes down with Moore's law, obviously. Because yes. Um, so you said something like uh, you really want to keep the machines working all the time because if they're on, you want to get the most out of that power. Um, how close to 100% utilization do you get? So um, my, my, oh, I took that graph out. We run at about 90% utilization. Um, okay. And that's, by the way, looking at um, inc including downtime when the systems are down for either upgrades or are down because they crashed or, you know, software upgrades or whatever. So um, we, we run, you know, we, we actually make a promise to the, the government that we'll run at about 85%, um, but, uh, you know, uptime. But we, we actually over hit um, over 90%. So much higher than a cloud center. Um, and uh, which are, I think they run at around 60% and certainly higher than a personal cluster, which tends to run at more like 20 to 30%. So I was thinking in terms of like uh, energy proportional computing. So if you get uh, machines that if you don't use full load on them, they use a lot less energy, would that help you? Is that something you guys yeah. can do? So we, we've, we've thought about that a little bit. And I think my conclusion is because we, um, we, because we have unlimited demand for the cycles, it's much better for us to try to run as to run at 90% utilization, or you know, basically as high as we can schedule the machine, and um, get as many publications done as we can, you know, as people can, and then um, and have fewer data centers around the country, as opposed to trying to um, make use of uh, machines when they're they're not being utilized. There's, there's it is a different market argument than in the business cloud because I think at least in some business applications, you know, if you need to c compute your payroll. Um, you, that's, that's the problem that you have. And if somebody comes to you and says, oh, but for only 50% more money, I can, I can give you twice as much computing, you'll say, I, I need to compute my payroll. I don't need another. You know, whereas if you come to a scientist and say, I can give you, you, can give you, you know, twice as much computing, they'll say, absolutely. Now, who's paying the bill is a different question. But it's a, funny, it's a different market because um, there's unlimited amounts of computing that people want to do. But, yeah, so in general, we're not very interested in those, uh, in, in trying to reduce the, I mean, I think we will want to reduce the energy use of the, the system. And people have looked at things like if the, if the network is being utilized, you want to turn the processors down because you're not using the processors. And if the processors are busy, maybe the network. But um, I want to uh, just have one more aside on power versus energy because there's been a lot of discussion about this um, in, in exascale. These are, these are related but somewhat different problems. Um, and I worry about both of them at NERSC. Um, the, the problem of um, energy efficiency is about um, you know, joules per pu sub publication or joules per application flop or something like that. Um, and it's about trying to, um, it's also, for me as a center director, it's about the, the electric bill that I have to pay every year, okay? Power is about how much cooling infrastructure and number of power cables and stuff I have to put into the center to make sure that no matter what's happening on the machine, I don't blow some fuse somewhere in the middle of PG&E. And um, that, that's a, it's, a, it's a different problem. And so it may be that techniques that I, I may want to do things like power Power capping. So we've talked about power capping on the systems to say we, you know, can the vendor guarantee to us that this system will never run at more than say 10 megawatts because we only want to put 10 megawatts worth of cooling and um, power infrastructure into our building. And we worry because the fluctuations are quite high. If you're running something like the Linpack benchmark, um, you can see about a 20% increase in the amount of power. That, may, that was actually lower than we thought it was going to be um, relative to kind of a normal workload. But, uh, um, but it's still enough that, you know, you have to put in, I mean, a, a megawatt of cooling also costs you about $3 million to install. So you don't want to, you know, uh, do this stuff if you don't have to. And they're, di they're different problems. It's about a peak problem versus a uh, kind of average problem. Um, race to halt, as I, I think I mentioned this in the previous slide, which is basically, you know, run as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible, and then turn the machine off is typically the best thing to do. Um, part of that is because leakage current is, is a substantial part of the, the energy that's used by processor chips. And so um, unless you're entirely turning them off, um, you're still going to have a lot of that, um, that leakage current. current. Um, dynamic clock speed scaling, so that's an, an interesting idea, especially for the peak uh, power problem, but uh, is not probably the right thing to do in terms of energy scaling. And then one of the things that comes, that comes up in this context is the idea, I think Patterson will say, you know, more transistors than you can afford to turn on on your processor chip. So Moore's Law is putting more transistors on the chip, but you can't, um, but you can't actually afford to power them all on. And so that leads to this idea of dark silicon, which is there are parts of the processor that you only use in certain times, and also leads to the idea that maybe you'll put a video de encoder or decoder on your processor chip because so many people um, spend a lot of time on their laptops deco decoding videos um, that you might want to have more specialized hardware.
Okay, so we want to select machines for um, making them the most effective for science so that we're utilizing them as well as possible to kind of to maximize the application capability. We have a set of application benchmarks we use at NERSC, or at least uh, we use in the, each of the procurements. They actually are slightly different with each procurement. Um, and this is the set that we used for the NERSC six benchmarks. I guess I don't have the names of the applications in here, but we picked uh, an application code from each of these um, different science areas. Um, also tends to cover what are called the, the dwarfs of scientific computing, which I think Jim has talked about. So um, we don't have Monte Carlo on there, but I'll show you one that actually is kind of like an independent parallelism problem when I show the performance results later. Um, I, I was trying to understand just the, um, the, what is the efficiency of the machines that are on the top 500 list. And, uh, and so I took um, some of the recent data. So this is a snapshot in time now of a single, um, I think the top 500 list from six months ago. And I sorted them by the kind of network in them and then looked at what percentage of peak they're getting on the LINPAC number. And so, you know, it's kind of noisy looking data within, within these groups. The first group is the custom networks. Those are things like the Cray systems. Then there's the, the, the GIGI um, Ethernet clusters, much lower performance, even on the LINPAC benchmark, which is a very compute intensive problem. Then you get the InfiniBand networks, and then you get some other, uh, this is a Marinette, here's a couple of Marinette systems and a NumaLink system there at the end. Um, so roughly speaking, you, you can see a pattern even in terms of the efficiency of running something as, as computer intensive as LINPAC benchmark um, across the different kind of networks. I was also looking for the GPUs in here. Um, that's harder to see. There, there are some GPU clusters. I think they're right there, kind of at the lower part of the, some of the efficiency numbers in the, um, in the InfiniBand. But I think the variability in the people tuning the LINPAC benchmark is higher than the variability from whether you're using GPUs or CPUs, which is sort of interesting. Okay, so what about what is going to happen with hardware and how does, what does this mean in terms of both computer science research problems and how it's going to affect people writing the scientific applications? So attack of the killer cell phones, what does that mean? Well, there's a picture of a cell phone processor to scale relative to an Intel Nehalem processor, um, a four-core processor, which is the kind of processor that's in the Carver system if you, you use that one at NERS, our smaller cluster system. Um, so the, uh, the, the Intel Nehalem is certainly faster. It's a 50 gigawatt, gigaflop core, and the uh, cell phone core is um, only 4 gigaflops. So there's about a factor of 10 difference where, you know, this is about a factor of 10 faster. Um, but there's a factor of 1,000 difference in the other direction on the amount of the, uh, the uh, power that's used between the two. So um, there's 0.1 watts for the cell phone processor and 100, 100 watts for the server processor. So you know, if you want to go to find people who know how to design energy efficient, power, power efficient processors, you don't go and talk to the server group, you go and talk to the cell phone designers because they've been worrying um, about the, the amount of power that cell phones have used since cell phones have existed. And um, I thought that cell phones were limited by the battery life because, of course, you want your cell phone to last all day. But in talking to somebody actually who's, who's doing this kind of stuff, they said actually the first problem is the heat of the cell phone. You don't want to have a hot cell phone in your pocket. So the heat is actually um, an even bigger constraint for them in many cases than battery life, but both of them are obviously important constraints. So in general, server processors like um, the traditional x86 processors have been designed for um, performance. They haven't been designed for energy because you're plugging them to the wall and people haven't worried so much about the energy until, until you started having cloud computing and high performance computing centers where you're starting to pay millions of dollars a year in um, the energy bill. Who knows how much Google spends in uh, electricity? Anybody seen that? So, uh, well, they, I guess they haven't said the amount of money, but they, they use a, a quarter of a gigawatt. So think, you know, or they, they buy power less expensively than a million dollars per megawatt. But still, in terms of orders of magnitude, it's, uh, it's about $250 million that they spend. So those places worry about energy, but um, people who are designing the, process, the, the server processors were not, have not been worrying about it so much until recently. Now, what about um, heterogeneity? So, so the... the um, conclusion from the previous slide is we want to build these systems out of little tiny simple processors. So what is, what, you know, what is the stuff that makes us very energy inefficient? Well, it runs serial code. Each one of those cores runs serial code pretty well because it's got out of order execution. It's got lots of caches. It's got hardware that's automatically um, you know, discovering parallelism for you in that sequential thread of control. That cell phone processor is very simple and doesn't do um, many of those things. But you're, you're wasting power um, trying to discover the parallelism in the other case. So that's says we want to build them out of really simple processors. Um, this is, is just an analytical argument that Mark Hill um, made a number of years ago about how much, um, how much, you know, what kind of heterogeneity you want on your chip. And um, so this is just looking at 
Um, you've got a fixed size chip, um, and it can hold up to 256 of those simple little cores. So we don't really know what they are. We're not looking at the details of the cores here. Just say, assume you've got a chip that holds 256 simple cores, um, and I can take some fraction of my chip area and make it a fat core that is going to run um, faster. And so at the other end of the spectrum, I just have, um, sorry, at this end of the spectrum, I have 256 cores. And at this end of the spectrum, then I have just one core because I've taken all of my chip area. And so the unit here is what is the size of my one fat core in terms of little cores. And so the size of my fat core is, is equal to the 256 little cores on the right end. And it's equal to just one core, so you don't have any in the other end. So someplace in the middle here is 64. You're taking the area for 64 little cores and turning them into one fatter core. Now, there's an assumption built in, which is that the fat core um, divided by the thin core has performed that's equal to the square root of the area advantage of that fatter core. So that's a kind of a not too unrealistic um, assumption about um, how much performance you get by making the chip larger. But obviously, it's a very, it's a very simplistic model of how much performance you're going to get. And then each one of these curves says for a different Omdahl fraction, that is, how much, what fraction of your code is parallel versus serial, um, how much performance are you going to get, or how much speed up are you going to get from these different things. And um, the, the answer is, unless you're running at you know, 0.999, um, 9%, uh, you know, so most of your code is, is all parallel, um, you know, your efficiency drops down quite a bit. And so this says you might want to have sort of a sweet spot in here. It might be around 64. Um, and so you need to have some amount of your code is going to be, is going to be um, serial even on a, sing, on a single chip. So you may want to have um, at least one core to run that. The other argument that people make a lot for heterogeneity as opposed to just one big um, C of little tiny cores is some, somebody's got to run the operating system. And the operating system tends to not be something that you can squeeze onto one of these little cores. It uses all those extra features, these extra instructions and so on that are, are not all of them, but it uses many of the instructions that are not used by most of the computing code. Um, so that's the other reason for heterogeneity. Now, we have to be careful, though, because that's a pure kind of energy hardware design argument. We need to go back to the applications and understand how the applications perform. This is work done by people here on campus and also um, people at the lab looking at um, uh, uh, Sam Williams, um, Koshik Dada, and, um, and others had, had uh, done this uh, benchmarking work looking at traditional multi-core processors and GPUs for a very simple problem, which is a seven-point stencil. So this is... You've, um, You've seen this in your structured grid sort of lectures. You're just averaging nearest neighbor code. So it's a really simple kind of computation. Um, and it's looking at these different architectures. So here's our um, traditional kind of multi-core processors. There's the cell processor, cell blade system. And there's GTX, um, two different versions of the uh, NVIDIA processor. So the, the left-hand graph is performance. And so the best thing you can do, you know, the, the GPU is certainly the best in terms of the performance. Um, but if you look at something like the, um, the power efficiency, then the, um, so, so in terms of gigaflops, you get more. But the, in terms of the power efficiency, then you also have something of, a, of an advantage, but a little bit lower. But the important thing is, what, what is the second GPU number here? The second GPU number is about what happens if the data doesn't all fit on the GPU side, and you need to move it back and forth every time you sweep through that mesh. Well, obviously, your performance drops a lot. You're moving data back and forth across the memory bus, uh, sorry, the PCI bus, um, which is why your gigaflop rate drops way down here, and it's the worst of all of the systems. Um, and, but it's also important to remember your power efficiency is also dropped um, by the same ratio as well. So it just to be careful when we talk about heterogeneity that we're really making things efficient for the applications as a whole, not just um, in some kind of theoretical peak limit. So the case for heterogeneity that I've already made is you want these lots of small cores. You might need at least one fat core. Um, there's questions about how you want to organize these things. Um, uh, what people often refer to as um, one of the advantages of GPU is that it has explicitly managed on-chip memory. That's called local store memory in some contexts or um, uh, scratch pad memory, um, where you're moving data um, in and out of the, uh, on and off of the chip explicitly. And um, it has an advantage from an energy standpoint because you only move the data that you absolutely need. And moving that data is very expensive. So it's very efficient, but also much more cumbersome to program. Um, the last thing that happens with today's GPUs and accelerators in general is that they're built on a coprocessor interface. So the CPU is a separate chip, and the GPU is over here. And not only are they separate chips, but they don't share any memory space, and they talk to each other by um, basically kind of a um, 
you know, a, a client-server kind of master-slave relationship where the CPU asks the GPU to do stuff for it, right? So, so it, it creates a model for the programmer that says your code is running on the CPU, and if you ever get to a loop that looks like it's really compute-intensive, then send it over to the GPU and have it do that loop there. That's kind of the, the CUDA programming um, model. But I think it, um, it sort of, th this interface, both in terms of the performance interface, but also in terms of the programming model, um, encourages uh, you know, serial thinking or includes, in, encourages sort of the wrong way of thinking about the, uh, the application problem, which is you want to be running all the code on the GPU because that's the fast, the, the energy efficient device. And if you, if there's something you can't do on the GPU, you want to ask the CPU to help you out because maybe it can do the system call for you. So I think those are the, uh, you know, th there, there are reasons why heterogeneity is good. Um, and I think we will probably see more heterogeneous processors, certainly in high performance scientific computing, but I think in general, but the, uh, but I, you know, I'm really hoping this coprocessor interface will go away, and we're seeing some some evidence of that in the market as well. So, um, Mark Marinchega, who used to be the uh, CEO at SGI, uh, coined this phrase, the swim lanes for exascale, and said, "Well, there's a few swim lanes for exascale, it's a slightly different one than shown here." But there, the first one is, let's say we've got multi-core, so it's traditional, say x86 processors, so Intel and AMD kinds of, of processors, and we just scale up using Moore's law. That was the graph that you saw on the first slide about um, the energy of an exascale system that gets us to a 200, me 200 megawatt system. So it's not really practical. Second one here is um, GPUs and accelerators, and the third one is you know just build chips with massive numbers of these kind of cell phone like processors or some other processors like that. So this you might think that the Intel Mic system, if you've heard about that, um, might be uh, kind of in this in this um, space here. Although right now it is configured as an accelerator attached to a GPU um, and uh, sorry attached to a CPU, and um, then these GPUs are as well. But um, you know, so these are kind of the, the different models you can think about, and these may at some point converge. So, you know, most people would say that a GPU is a many-core processor. Um, but the question of how you organize the lightweight cores, how do they talk to each other, um, are they first-class cores, that is, can they run any code, and can they ask any other, other processor to do something for them, or like today on a GPU where they're only doing things that the CPU sort of asks them to do, um, that, those are really the, the key architectural questions. And how much data parallelism is there? Um, GPUs take a, enormous uh, benefit from data parallelism, but even traditional multi-core have these wide SIMD units on them, a, the ABX and um, other SSE and so on that you've seen in, uh, like in your matrix multiply assignment that um, is really important to getting good performance out of these things. Data parallelism is very efficient from an energy standpoint because you don't have, you only just have, to, you have to just decode one instruction and then you just do it um, on all of the cores. So that's why people tend to like to use data parallelism, but it doesn't do you any good if your applications don't have data parallelism in it to exploit. So that's where you have to be careful about um, you know, building a system that's only good in theory and not in practice. Um, so that's kind of the, the big questions around exascale and the architectures. Um, DOE has a model, uh, they, they have an exascale program that they've been talking about, and this is a picture I just put together to try to explain um, kind of what they, they see as the center of their exascale program, which is something called co-design and um, these co-design of applications. So what is the idea that... Um, well, we don't really know what the hardware looks like, um, but we think it's going to change. And for the first time in many years, um, or at least in the last few years, um, this has been different that, that I think um, Intel and AMD and IBM and others that design um, conventional processors are trying to understand what to do with the chip area that will be useful to the users. So they are actually listening to scientists who were, before were just taking the processors that other people were building for their applications. Um, and they're, they're trying to understand, is there a little bit they can put into their GPUs, for example, that will make these useful for real science problems. Um, and that's, um, so that's kind of what the exascale architecture. And I put new here because this was not true 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we were just basically using the processors that people were building for other application domains um, for the most part. And so the question is, you want to look at the applications and try to understand how to design the architectures. Um, we won't have complete control over them, but we might be able to influence them. And on the other hand, some of the things that will happen in the architecture, such as software managed memory, which is, is good for energy efficiency, might not be what the application people would choose, but that's going to influence the applications. Um, and so you want to kind of have this tight design loop where people are co-designing applications with architecture and also applications with software. And of course, the software is affected by the architecture as well. Now, they, the, the Department of Energy has three of these co-design centers. One of them is actually on combustion, which I mentioned earlier involves some of the people that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, and there's another one on materials, and there's one on um, 
uh, designing of nuclear ener um, ener energy devices and nuclear reactors. And so those are some of the, the basic uh, um, applications that they're thinking of for exascale. And so they have these co-design centers where the people are supposed to work on the applications and the, and the uh, um, software and the architectures as well. Now, all the other applications in the world that are not part of a co-design project also are going to be influenced by whatever those architectures and the software model look like. But we're trying to figure out how to program these things and what the hardware looks like. So there's a really um, interesting project called um, Codex that John Schalf is running. Um, so he didn't get to talk about his own stuff. He talked about his old stuff when he was here, unfortunately. So I'll talk a little bit about his stuff. But it's looking at this idea of these really simple cores. And if you don't know what the hardware is going to look like, how do you actually run an application and understand whether an application would run well or not on a different kind of architecture than we have today? Um, and he had a project called Green Flash. Um, that looked at building a hardware emulator. So this is taking a, a set of FPGAs using ideas developed in the RAMP project here in the computer science department, uh, the computer science division on campus, which is a research accelerator for multiprocessors. And you take a design, these really simple cores, for example, which are custom, customizable cores that come from Tensilica, and then he ran a climate model on top of them with lots of help from a lot of other people in the group who re rewrote the code um, to run on top of the climate model. So Schwab Camille, who was a former student and probably TA in this class, um, uh, did some of the work in mapping the climate code onto these, um, these very lightweight cores. And they, this is much faster. These, these um, FPGAs are much faster way of, of um, understanding, getting the performance than um, doing a software simulation, so doing just architectural simulation. So you can actually afford to run a real application on it. I mean, you're not running a full-scale, you know, 100-year climate model, but you can actually run the, the um, climate code stack. Um, so a little bit more about the RAMP project. So this is um, Krista Sanovich and John Worsnick and others um, looking at um, you know, how you build these kinds of FPGAs for hardware emulation. And there's a, a project in there called Chisel, which is um, you, know, you need to get a software stack um, in addition to this hardware design. So you, you have this um, thing called the Chisel compiler. And out of that, you get, a, um, you get some C++ code, um, which gives you a, a simulator. And you get an em emulator. And then you get uh, layouts. So you can actually do hardware design if you want to. So this is kind of looking at some of the lower level um, ways in which architects can, do, in, can innovate and look at future projects processor designs, including things that would be used in an exascale system. Now, if you redesign the processors, um, we, also, we also have to redesign the um, software that runs on them because the instruction set itself may very well change. This is just looking at, you know, that kind of back to that original picture. So this was using an assumption of 130 megawatts for the business as usual picture down from the 200, but there's, there's big error bars in these things. So, you know, over 100 megawatts of power. Um, this is a many core system where we've, we've now gotten rid of um, a lot of the power that in that biggest part piece of the pie um, there, but we still have the next biggest part we have to worry about is the, the, um, the memory. And so there's also a lot of work that I haven't really talked about on um, how to make the memory system more, more efficient. Part of that is looking at local store ideas, so you're only moving data um, in and out of the memory system when you need to, but part of it is also looking at new memory technology. So some of this will have to happen in the vendors, um, and some of this will happen in an academic sort of environment. But um, you know, we, we put these things together, and we might be able to get down to our, um, our system. And just, uh, let's see, I don't know. Have you seen these slides on memory scaling trends? So I'll just mention a little bit more about memory scaling trends. So, you know, memory density, so if we forget about memory bandwidth for a minute, but even memory density has been scaling on an exponential growth um, scale, which is a good thing. But it's not the same scale that Moore's Law has been on. It's been, it turned over in about um, the late 1990s, um, and it's, about, it's doubling about every three years. Now, I actually think Moore's Law is also turning over a bit, and it's not going to be doubling every 18 months. I think it, somebody said it is getting closer to three years. But in this time period, um, Moore's Law was still growing faster. Um, you know, um, transistor density on the logic side, that is on processor design, was growing much faster than on the memory side. So what this means is that it's harder and harder to build a balanced system where you have as much memory as you want because you have to put so much of your money into the memory system. And, um, and there's another graph uh, also. These are both from IBM looking at the uh, cost of computing over time versus the cost of memory. And cost of computing, of course, um, from a cost standpoint, was also dropping much faster. OK, so what does all of this mean about the programming models? Well, the first thing is, let's see, in this class, you've looked at OpenMP and you've looked at MPI, but you haven't really done the hybrid, right? In any of the assignments, have they done hybrid OpenMP, MPI? I don't think so. OK, so. Um, 
So at, at NERSC, um, actually, um, especially before we installed the hopper system, um, on Franklin, the most popular programming model is what we call flat MPI. That is one MPI process per core. Um, on that system, there are quad core processor chips, so you could use shared memory with each set of four chips, um, but most people don't do that because it, they had MPI applications before, and the easiest thing to do is just to continue running them, and it means you're do, sending messages through shared memory. Um, and so it worked pretty well on Franklin. On Hopper, we are pushing the users to try to add some shared memory parallelism in their code because there's 24 cores per, per node. Um, they're organized as sort of sets of six per die. So t we, we think typically for most applications, one MPI process per six cores is the right thing to do. Um, but uh, um, you know, it's, it's already this idea of one MPI process per core is kind of already running out in um, on Hopper. And the, the problem is you don't have enough memory to have an MPI process per core. You don't have enough memory bandwidth. And um, you're, you're, just, you're kind of wasting the fact that you've got hardware-supported shared memory inside of the node. So um, it's, you know, how long is this gonna, going to last? Well, certainly it's already starting to run out. And um, we don't think it's, it's going to, uh, it's certainly not going to get us to exascale. And if you start building systems out of GPUs, you certainly can't use an MPI process per core. Um, you might be able to use it per node and use, do something else like CUDA inside, but you can't put an MPI process in each one of the little GPU threads. So what's the problem? Well, there's some overhead of trying to do message passing, um, the latency in terms of copying the data back and forth um, between the different memory spaces. Because in MPI, you have f separate memory spaces. So you fundamentally have to copy data when you transfer it from one um, when, you, when you want to share something. The memory utilization can be a problem because you're forced to partition your data sets structures, and in some cases when you really want to share them, you end up having to replicate them. So, um, you know, even if you look at something like a simple uh, structured grid problem and you have little subgrids because you've got little tiny, and imagine you've got a thousand cores on a chip, you're going to put a little 10 by 10 by 10 cube on each one of those little tiny cores. Half of your points are on the surface area, so you're replicating half of your, uh, of, you know, you've got a 50% overhead for each one of those things. To, to replicate the surface area. Memory bandwidth is a problem, and um, you know a, a lot of the successes in, and certainly not all of them, but many of the big petascale applications did come from weak scaling. That is, the idea that you make the problem bigger as you make the machine bigger. And um, you know, so first of all, it doesn't work for all science problems. But even if it does work for your science problem, like in climate modeling, we make the, the um, mesh that's around the Earth uh, finer and finer resolution, you still can't get enough memory per core that you can actually do this kind of weak scaling forever. So, so instead, we have to w work harder at finer grain parallelism. And um, that means that there's going to be a new programming model. You have heard about auto-tuners, and I guess I'll just say here that I think auto-tuners are a piece of the picture for exascale because if you're going to change your architecture and you're going to use something, whether it's a GPU, an Intel mic, or something we've never even seen before as the, um, as the, as the uh, energy-efficient compute engine, um, it's really hard to build a general-purpose compiler. That's my field, and doing a you know, general-purpose optimizing compiler that hides from you what that architecture looks like is probably not going to be realistic. It's certainly not in the next 10 years, while, while we, we don't even know what the architectures look like yet. Um, and so um, what, the, but what auto tuning does, um, at least one, one way of looking at it, is that you're building a little code generator for a very specialized piece of code. And so even though the code generator for an x86 system and a, for a, a CUDA based you know, architecture GPU um, or, or an, uh, you know, some other kind of um, a GPU system, may, they, those code generators may look very different. It's much easier to build a code generator for one application domain or one, one algorithmic kernel. Um, or a set of algorithmic kernels that are closely related um, and, uh, um, and the architecture than it is to build a general purpose compiler that understands arbitrary applications and translates them into hardware. Um, so one of the other big challenges that people worry a lot about exascale, um, we worried a lot about petascale, we actually worried about interascale, um, is uh, resilience. So, um, this is the, uh, the thing that, that people worry, you know, always worry that the machine, you'll build this big, huge system and it'll never run. The, um, the biggest system in the world today is also the fastest system, which is the Japanese K computer. I believe it's around 700 cabinets at this point. Um, I thought it heard originally it was going to be 800. Um, the, Hopper, the, the Franklin system that we're about to turn off, as I said, is about 100 cabinets. The Jaguar system at Oak Ridge, which is uh, number, is it number two still, is, um, is uh, 
about 200 cabinets. So um, as Senator Director, I think a 200 cabinet system is about the limit of what I'd ever like to actually um, have on the floor um, because what you worry about is the failure of the individual components. You've seen this on Franklin. So um, on fr what is the difference between Franklin and Hopper? And what, the why, what is the reason that I think you should be using Hopper as <laughs> Franklin for this class? Well, because um, you really do not want a single component failure to kill the whole system. So the, the people that are designing these systems have to give us systems in which the whole system doesn't die whenever a, a single component dies. On Franklin, you can survive a node failure. It kills your job, but it doesn't kill the whole machine. But network failures on Franklin kill the entire machine. So that um, is something that Cray you know, realized was a real problem with that. And on the hopper system, which has a different network, it's not true. So you can actually go and pull a cable out of the back of the hopper system in the network, and the system will keep running. The jobs that are not involved in that particular link, actually the messages will, in many cases, route around them. So depending on what, how, how, you know, exactly what, you've, what, what has died. Um, but some jobs may be, be lost, but the system itself will stay up and running. So what the, you know, the, uh, we have kind of on the average of a, a system-wide outage every month um, is reasonable, and um, you know if it that that's uh, you know it takes hours to restart the system when the whole thing goes down, and I think at this point if we assume the network is resilient, um, the weakest links in the system in terms of the system-wide outages are in the in the network right now in Franklin, which is not true in Hopper, and the file system. File system is actually the thing that I mostly worry about in terms of resilience because um, not because the file system itself uh, is necessarily the failure mode, but if anything else goes wrong in the system, the file system seems to be the thing that sort of falls over and dies. So um, you know, any bit gets corrupted or whatever, the file system gets confused and then the whole thing doesn't work. So one of the questions is how much do you want to hide all of these errors that are happening from the users? People are saying, oh, we need fault resilient algorithms, we need fault resilient applications, um, and uh, and on the other hand, maybe we want to just hide all of the failures underneath so you never see them and things automatically recover. So here's a kind of a little word of, of warning. This is, I think, Brian's data um, looking at uh, um, systems. That this is, was running on, um, actually ignore the, the Franklin line. We're just going to look at the two Jaguar lines, which is looking at two different, um, two different machines with, um, sorry, XT the two different versions of the same machine. And what you're seeing here, this is now processor numbers on the system. So these are all running simultaneously. And this is the amount of time it's taking for them to do a certain computation. It's an equal computation. So all of them are running basically the same computation. Um, and they should all finish at roughly the same time. So this amount of variability you would expect because of caches and so on. And what you don't expect to see are these big spikes. And what are the big spikes coming from? Well, after a lot of investigation, they, they, they determined that the, the, the um, spikes were because there were error correcting codes that were happening in the uh, memory. So ECC um, was happening. So these were sort of nodes that had not quite dead memory, but not very good memory. And so there were enough ECC errors happening that even though the code was running correctly, it was running much slower. This is fault tolerance, fault resilience happening automatically in hardware. So this is very fast, right? And, you know, okay, so the conclusion from this is go take those memory dims out and put in good ones. Um, so that's, that's a good thing to do. But the higher level point is be careful about what you try to hide from the uh, higher level software because if you try to hide these errors in other ways, for example, by having software mechanisms that automatically recover, what they're going to turn into is performance variability in your system. And as you know, a lot of the scientific calculations have a fair number of barrier synchronization points. You're simulating per time step or you're simulating forward um, in some kind of an iterative solver, and you do have to synchronize every once in a while to keep everything working together. So, so, just, so, so for that one, if there were a barrier at the end of the loop, you'd be waiting till the end. You'd of be the waiting spikes. for the spikes, right? Yeah, for the top of the spikes. In so, those two. so, is this a particularly bad example, or is this typical? Uh, this is a particularly bad example because the memory the memory dims are bad. So we we shouldn't see this on most uh, you know systems, but it, it, the. Uh, I think it will become more typical if we're trying to automatically, you know, hide various kinds of failures in the chips. Okay. So those are some of the uh, um, problems that come up from um, from the, uh, um, you know, that that are challenges in this in the programming model. And so we need to understand how um, uh, how the uh, um, how we're going to design these programming models in order to make them more fault resilient and, uh, and deal with the, uh, the, the problems with the memory performance and so on. And this idea of kind of trying to understand the applications and the hardware changes. Okay, and the last point, which you've, I think, heard quite a bit about, so I won't spend too much time on it, is really about algorithms to optimize for communication. Um, so you've seen this graph, right? 
or should I talk about, I'll talk about this, I can talk about this graph, okay. So this is looking at, okay, so if, if the name of the game, once again, is energy per computation, the question is how much energy is used in order to perform certain operations in, um, in a computer system today? Well, here's the, there's two different lines here. There's the blue line, which is today, and there's a projection of what things will look like in 2018. And here's a double precision floating point operation. Notice it's a log scale, okay? So today it takes about 100 picojoules in order to do a double precision floating point operation. In order to move that same data um, into, an, uh, um, in a, to uh, access the data that's in, sitting in register, it's substantially lower, so it's, um, you know, a few, a few picojoules in order to get the data out of a register. So you've already put it in the register and now you need to get it out of the register in order to, flop, to do the flop on it and to move it to the functional unit. So that's pretty low. If it's sitting in the L1 cache that's on chip, it's still um, pretty low. And um, even on the L2 chip, so this is five millimeters away, so a little bit further across the chip, um, it gets a little bit worse. But now what happens as soon as you go off chip to say DRAM or even off, uh, then, then you're um, up here at an order of magnitude worse um, than, the, uh, amount of than the amount of energy that's used for doing the computing. Okay, so a factor of 10 um, to go off chip just to access DRAM. Now to go across the whole machine is actually not that much worse than going to DRAM, um, although it, it, I want to remind you it is log scale. So it certainly does get worse going across the machine. But the issue is not really the distance the data is traveling. It's the process of going out through the pins on the chip um, there's a lot of memory that's used to drive those pins and um, getting then kind of out either into the network or into the DRAM. Um, both of those are, are very expensive from an energy standpoint. And some of these things we expect to get better over time with, you know, Moore's Law and so on. That's, that's the, uh, you know, the double precision floating point will get better. Some of these things in the interconnect level will get better. Um, but, you know, a certain amount, of, so some of the problem of just trans, transferring data across the chip is probably not going to change. So you've heard about communication avoiding algorithms, um, and uh, you know I'll just give kind of my, my perspective on this, which may be a little bit different than Jim's in terms of the in terms of the history was. Um, you know, there was a lot of work that the group, the Bebop group, had done on automatic performance tuning of sparse matrix vector multiply, and um, we kept trying to make matrix vector multiply go as fast as possible. Um, Rich Vudek, who's a graduate student at the time, I remember coming in one day to the Bebop meeting and saying, well, this is the breakdown of how much time is spent um, in matrix, sparse matrix vector multiply on a few different machines, um, and how much, that, how much time it takes just to read the matrix. And the really disturbing thing was most of the time that it took to do an SPMV was taken by reading the matrix. So it was, you know, we had, after years of work, we had optimized it to the point that you couldn't really do any better because you have to read the matrix once, right? And so then in the Krilov subspace methods, um, where you're going to read the matrix over and over again and do, doing a sparse matrix vector multiply, then the question was, um, could you just read the matrix once and take k steps of the matrix vector multiply? So we move that data from DRAM into the on-chip memory onto some cache where it's both energy efficient and time efficient, and then we get to take multiple steps. And so that was at least one of the early motivations behind this, and kind of from, from my perspective as a computer scientist, it was very, I, I was very discouraged at the point because we had kind of decided, well, we can't make these things go any faster because we, we know we have to meet the, read the matrix once. Um, and so this idea was to try to make the uh, um, solvers uh, actually work by only reading it once and taking multiple steps. And I think you've, they've heard about the Krilov stuff, right? So I won't really go into the, the details on it, but of course the um, important thing is uh, you, can, you can fiddle around with your, from there again, from my perspective as a compiler writer, all you're doing is interchanging loops. You have one outer loop, which is the number of iterations, and you have an inner, inner loops that are doing the sparse matrix vector multiply, and you're just kind of interchanging those so that you're, um, when, you, when you're blocking things up, <coughs> of course, it's much more complicated than that to actually write the code. Um, but the, the more important thing is that when you just kind of rearrange things like that, this was GM res and Mark Holman's thesis, the, the thing doesn't converge anymore, so um, you have to think much harder about it and uh, uh, um, and then you can get convergence back if you use a different basis. Okay, so, um, so you've heard a lot about communication avoiding algorithms. I think that they'll, they'll be really important moving forward on all different scale machines because, um, be, because you, you really want to reduce the amount of uh, memory traffic. So I have a little digression here into um, cloud computing because, um, because I still hear people say, well, forget about these stupid you know, exaflop machines or using way too much power. I don't really care about running simulations at scale. I only want to run lots of little simulations or even lots of serial jobs. So I'll just run them in the cloud where I don't have to worry about the price of um, power. And of course, you don't have to worry about the price of power, but um, Google, Amazon, Yahoo all do. Um, so there was a study, another study I was involved with a, a few years ago 
and, um, and it was called uh, Computing Performance Game Over and Next Level. So this is a National Academy's re report on computing performance. And, um, and it looks at all of the different kind of uh, problems of, of keeping com computing performance going. Um, and I think you've seen some versions of this, this graph before. So this is you know, Moore's Law going up like this, but this is actually computing performance. And then 2004, it leveled off. So we expected things to keep going. And I still find this today when I go to a meeting with, even with you know, very well-educated computer scientists who I think implicitly believe that computers will just continue getting faster um, the way they have in the past. Or they think it doesn't matter because they've always gotten faster and it just sort of, um, they can keep thinking about, about new, uh, new problems to solve with computers without um, worrying about computing performance. So um, Sam Fuller, who was the chair of the study group, made this version of the graph and called this the expectation graph, which I think is just a nice way of talking about computing performance in general. Um, this little news thing down here was about the NSA maxing out the, ba the Baltimore power grid. Um, there was another one about a, a data center facility, a co-location site that was bu that's building one in Nevada with um, a half a gigawatt of power. So that's, uh, that's uh, you know, about a half a billion dollars of, um, of uh, electricity if they fill up the whole thing. I don't know where that was done a few years ago. I'm not sure where that's at in terms of the, um, the economy. But you can see there's a lot of power going into these other, um, these, these data centers in general. So, um, but this, this, um, uh, one of the other people that was involved, at least in a, we had a workshop then um, in talking about this report, and Dave Liddell, who um, is, works in, with venture capital, in, venture capital and worked in um, uh, the New York Times, talked about this idea of maneuvering speed, which I really like this analogy. So he, he flies um, his own planes and stuff, and he talks about, he said in, in the, the processor industry was really running at maneuvering speed. So what is maneuvering speed? So when you're, when you're um, flying a, I guess, a jet, there's, a, um, there's two different speeds that you have to worry about exceeding. One is the speed at which the plane cannot go that fast and you, you know, it will crash if you try to go over a certain speed. So you never, you never exceed that one. There's another speed called maneuvering speed at which you can fly in a straight line but you can't turn. Okay? So you can fly fast, really fast at this maneuvering speed. And, it, and his analogy is the processor industry was flying at maneuvering speed in terms of these kind of design of x86 style microprocessors um, and uh, you know you can you, we have a design we're going to stick with it it's working well the software industry doesn't have to make changes every time we design a new processor and we'll just keep doing the same thing over and over again by you know making uh, the architecture uh, adding these architecture innovations that are not really visible to the software um, because we can keep making it go faster and so then when multi-core when when power density became the problem and the chips became too hot and they couldn't make them go any faster then you know they weren't able to turn very they weren't very nimble at being able to turn so um, so this is about then you know all, all the things that I've talked about here in terms of you know many core processors algorithms that avoid data movement um, how, you know how are you going to design the software and you know I think one of the big risks here is that you um, that you build systems that aren't actually good for some real problems that you want to solve I guess one other set, uh, story I'll mention I, I was on a, um, there's a, there was a workshop called the NIDRD workshop looking at high-performance computing applications in general and, um, and the impact of that. Actually, Al Gore came and gave the lunchtime talk, and it's all online if you want to watch the videos. But um, people were talking about, you know, the, so Jeanette Wing gave actually a really nice uh, kind of kickoff uh, keynote talk about, um, you know, what happens when you wake up in the morning and how is your life different today than it was 20 years ago? And the answer was, well, the first thing you do is, um, you, you know, before you get out of bed, you read your email on your iPhone. And I said, no, this isn't true. People don't all read their email on their iPhone before they get out of bed in the morning. Apparently, 30% of people actually do something on their iPhone before they even get out of bed in the morning. And so I said, and, and so, you know, people will say, well, this is all about the great algorithms and the innovations and the idea that you can, you know, put all of this stuff into this personal device. Um, what would that device have looked like 20 years ago? Well, that would have been a Cray um, YMP. Um, and it would have, uh, you know, filled up most of the bed, and um, it, it, would, it would have caused the bed to collapse as well. And uh, it was a new, newly designed YMP system that didn't require a special power system around it in order to run it. So that was nice, but um, you know, it was still certainly not not your handheld device. So computing performance and the improvements that you get in the size and the cost and the performance of systems have been really important to these innovations. The second example was Google. So what you know, what do you do on your iPhone? Well, the first thing you want to know is, you know, where are you going to go eat eat breakfast? If where's the low, low the closest Starbucks, when I'm, whenever I'm traveling, I'm always looking at where's the closest Starbucks because um, at least I know what I'm going to get then. Um, and uh, so, you know, you look at this up at Google. Well, you know, you've got your – Google has probably – I'm just going to guess here – probably on the order of a dozen data centers, probably about 20, 20 megawatts each. Um, and uh, so – 
you know, 20 years ago, those have been, have been at least 20 gigawatt facilities. And, um, you know, Google has green, they're, they're very big on kind of hydropower. So where do you find 20 gigawatts of hydropower? I think there's one place in the world. Does anybody know where it is? Three Gorges Dam in uh, China. So that, that, that's, a three, that's a 20 gigawatt um, hydro. So they, I think they have, that's the only place. I don't think the hydro plants in, um, in Oregon, although I'd be interested to hear if they're... Giga, giga gigawatts. Yeah, because it's 20 megawatts today, but, but in, 20, in technology that was 20 years ago, if you tried to build a Google data center, it would have required at least 20 gigawatts. And so, um, so the point is not that, um, you know, that pr computing performance was everything, but that you needed both the, ben the improvements in computing performance and the innovation in algorithms and kind of I novel applications of computing and so on in order to get these, um, all these great things we have today. So what about the cloud? So we took... Um, a group, so Lavanya, um, Ramakrishnan, Keith Jackson, John Shelf, Harvey Wasserman, and others in different parts of this study. Um, Shane Cannon's name is not on there for the blast stuff, but anyway, um, looked at those six applications that I said we use at NERSC for trying to understand what kind of HPC system to run, and they ran them on the Amazon um, EC2 cloud. And this is the performance slowdown um, relative to running them on, a, uh, on an HPC system. I think this was actually relative to um, Franklin at the time. And so this is the slowdown that you get for the different applications. You can see, you know, really bad things happening in Paratech. Paratech is a DFT code, a material science code. It has 3D FFTs sending the data, doing these big transposes around the system. The, uh, the EC2 network just doesn't keep up. Now they talked to, um, we, we built another kind of um, cloud test bed called Magellan, but it's really just uh, in, as run in this particular mode. It did not have the hypervisor on it. It has an InfiniBand network. These are small scale versions of the benchmarks, so they actually run pretty well on InfiniBand band network. They're not the same versions that we run for buying our HPC systems. And the thing only, the one that does run pretty well here is BLAST. Um, BLAST is a massively independent parallel, humiliatingly parallel, if you will, set of um, BLAST runs that are from genomics. And so each one of those is a serial job, but there's um, hundreds or thousands of those jobs um, put together. And so they, they run completely independent. And that kind of workload runs pretty well in a cloud. Um, because it's not using the network. And so um, there's, a, there's a report on this, and I won't go into a lot of details, but here's just one example of the, um, the, the uh, let's look at Paratech as an example. Um, this is saying, well, what is it that makes the cloud so much slower? Is it the virtualization? Is it the network? Or what is it? So this is just looking at the, the network. So here's the performance. This is now... Um, uh, this is speed up, so this is up is up is good here, and um, the gold standard here is the uh, is actually the um, the InfiniBand network cluster. So this is running on our own local Carver system, and then we're comparing that to well, what happens if you take the IB hardware, the inner, inner, the InfiniBand hardware for the network, but you run a TCP stack over it? Well, performance turns over at some point, and you can't really get scaling even out to a thousand cores, which isn't all that many cores. Um, for a lot of these jobs. And then what if you're running a 10 gig network? Um, well, the performance is even lower. And then if you're running a 1 gig network, you know, it's even worse. So that says the network is certainly an important part of the picture. Um, virtualization is also an important part of the picture in terms of what happens to the performance. So this is now running, there's still the IB um, network, but then here is the um, 10 gig network without, um, with, uh, without virtualization. And then this is the um, this is what happens um, with virtualization. This um, cluster cloud was something Amazon did. It actually showed up in the previous, uh, with one of the earlier slides is the beta version. So Amazon said, they, they actually talked to the people at the lab and they said, okay, well, what can we do to make our clouds more effective for science? And the answer was, we'll put in a better network. So they put in a 10 gig network and, um, and also run them as a batch scheduled thing without, with, um, so they're still doing uh, virtualization here, but they're not doing, um, uh, but, they're, but they, they have a slower network. So anyway, you can see that you still get a substantially slower Qu performance. Question yes. about these experiments. So uh, it's the same processor and the, only the network changed? Um, let's see. So I, I, you know, I can't say that, ex that it's exactly the same processor. It's really hard to do these, ex especially in the Amazon cloud. Who knows what processor you're getting, right? So, yeah. Um, so we also looked at the the cost of running these, um, these different systems. So NERSC, as I said, has an annual budget of about $55 million a year. Um, we have about 200,000 cores in the, system, in the center right now. We've got 40,000 cores in Franklin, 150,000 cores in Hopper, and um, a bunch of other smaller clusters that have um, on, you know, tens of thousands of cores in general. So, um, so just a simple kind of numerical um, argument, you get to a couple of cents, um, two to three cents per 
core hour just to deliver science. Now, we don't quite deliver that many hours. So we've got, let's say we run them at 90%. I think this, this is an assumption that runs, is making an assumption we run at 85% utilization in terms of the number of hours delivered. Um, but, but still, we run a very um, cheap computing center, even though we have very specialized high-performance computing networks in our hardware. And, um, you know, this is what it would cost if we tried to go out and buy kind of for list price um, the same kind of computing on the cloud. So there's $180 million of compute um, in terms of core hours. There's our, our tape archive. So 17 petabytes would take another $12 million, two petabytes in the file system, which is actually grown, growing right now. Um, we're putting in a bigger file system. That's another couple million dollars. And so the annual cost is close to $200 million. Um, and that has nothing to do with performance differences, right? This just is let's not worry about how fast the cores run. Maybe we only want to run serial jobs. It's just saying, how much per core hour does it cost to do something? And it, and it doesn't take into account differences in clock speed. So probably the cloud processors are slower than the processors that are in Hopper and Franklin, but um, they're certainly not faster than uh, the, like the ones that are in, in the smaller clusters like Carver. So why is this? Because people think of clouds as, clouds are cheap, right? Clouds are almost free. Um, and what are the factors that go into the price difference? Well, I think the most important thing is utilization. And as I said before, we run at around 90% utilization in HPC centers, and um, whereas a cloud might run at more like 60% utilization, and a private someone might run at 20 to 30% utilization. Wide variations in these numbers, but just to give you kind of ballpark. But that's a really big factor in the price. And so the price, um, the cloud Clouds are much more expensive from that standpoint because, and why is that? Because they want to provide you with the illusion that when you want to run a job, you can run the job almost immediately, this elasticity sort of idea. And, um, and so we, we make people wait in the queues, and you've seen this, right? That's why you're running on hoppers, because the queue wait time is lower. So the um, utilization is mostly a, a function of how much you're willing to make people wait. Actually, uh, when you announced that Franklin was being taken down, the queue shrank dramatically, so it's better on Franklin. Right, that's what I said. That's why people are using Franklin, because the wait oh. times are lower. Right, yeah. yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, that's why we did that, was to clear off all those other people from Franklin. <laughs> so you can use it for the class, right? What's that? Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's what we're hoping people are getting off of it. So um, the, the next factor is the cost of people. I talked about that a little bit, but the largest machine has got the lowest cost. So maybe there's a slight advantage here for Amazon, you know, Yahoo, uh, so on. They may be able to have somewhat fewer people per core than we do. Um, but we've got pretty big systems, and so we, we're pretty far up that efficiency curve. Cost of power, okay, we both we all buy power in bulk. We have a, a program in California called WAPA, so we get pretty good power prices here. Um, but they may get better power prices, especially if they manage to build their d data centers right top of a dam, um, and, um, but so they've got an advantage there. Energy efficiency, well, we're kind of probably about equal. If you're down to about 1.1, you're not going to do much better in terms of the efficiency. Cost of specialized hardware, so the interconnects. So we spend money buying fast interconnects. But if you look at even the cost of our hardware, we're buying standard processors, we're buying standard um, memory systems, you know, standard DRAM, and um, we may buy somewhat kind of higher, at the higher end of the bins, if you will. So we buy, you know, things that are running at a little bit higher clock speed, but um, the cost of the hardware is slightly to the, you know, is more expensive for the HPC center than a cloud center. The big thing is profit, right? We don't make a profit, um, and, um, and they certainly do make a profit. And this um, slide just shows, this was actually a big surprise to me. So Shane Cannon collected some of the numbers to look at the historical trends on the Amazon's cloud pricing. And in this five-year period, um, their price per core hour dropped by 15%, 18% over five years, okay? 18% drop over five years is abysmally bad, right, in terms of how much you're tracking Moore's Law. So that was supposed to be the other thing, you're going to track Moore's Law. Well, you're not tracking it in terms of price. And um, in this same period of time, we went from um, Franklin having 20,000 cores. It was originally a dual-core system. We doubled the number of cores. We added Hopper, which added 150,000 cores. So we basically went from 20,000 cores in the center to 200,000 cores in the center over that same period of time, which means that our, and in roughly a flat budget, and so our price per core hour dropped by a factor of 10, while theirs dropped by 18 percent. And, um, you know, the, the other argument here, which is looking at kind of how many cores are there per socket, um, that was certainly going up at a much higher rate than the 18 percent. Um, and so the, uh, um, and roughly speaking, even when you're buying a large system with the interconnect and the memory and everything else, um, your cost per socket is, has been relatively constant over time, but they're not tracking that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of going back and summarizing the challenges for exascale. It's about power, how to get massive concurrency for efficiency, the memory system, the processors, the programming model, the algorithms, I.O., which I didn't talk about very much, resilience. Um, 
you know, and uh, all of these things, and, and bisection bandwidth, all, all of these things with the possible exception of nine and maybe eight, although even eight, if you've got long-running jobs, resilience is an issue, are a problem independent of how big the application is that you want to run. It's just about whether you want to have a system that is a thousand times more, a thousand times faster for roughly the same price um, that you do today. And so it's really about computing performance in general. And that's really the conclusion, that exascale is about computing performance, and it means, you know, and a big factor here that's hard to control is what will the market do? So what will the GPU vendors do? What will the microprocessor vendors do? Um, and how can we take advantage of that in scientific computing? And with that, I will end and see if there are any questions. Any questions? Yes. Oh. So have there been efforts uh, made to use the heat from the processors? Um, good, good question. So the heat from the processors, um, we, we are not using them currently. What we do in the data centers is um, we use what call, are called hot aisle and cold aisle. So you try to isolate the cold aisle because then you don't have to refrigerate the entire machine room. So at least you're isolating the heat. Um, in the CRT building that we're building, we are going to use the, the heat from the machine room to heat the rest of the building. Um, there's been a question about whether we could heat the city of Berkeley or <laughs> other things like that. I don't think there's that much heat. And also, right now, the, the heat that's the, the it's not clear that it's quite hot enough to do something reliable. I think there's a center in Switzerland. They thought about trying to heat a swimming pool, the local area swimming pools with the heat. So people are certainly talking about it, but um, it, it, we, we've got to make it probably a little bit hotter, which is what the, the uh, processor vendors are trying to do so that the heat, waste heat is actually more useful. But there's, but there's also pumping the uh, fog through the building to cool it off. Right, we'll use the outside air cooling um, to, uh, yeah, not quite the fog, hopefully, but anyway, we'll take out the fog and, and pump in the cool, cold, cool air and use that, yes. They do use it to heat the building already, okay, yeah, so, wait, so which university is that? Okay, so, yeah, so it is, it is being used elsewhere, and I think there's a, there's a data center in, um, I think NREL might have a data center that's also doing that, so, yeah, it is an idea that's being used. Okay, well, thank you. The next speaker is sitting in the back corner. Aiden Bullish will be talking about parallel graph algorithms next time.